Hey folks, welcome to lecture seven. I'd like to start this lecture by complimenting you on such a great job on midterm one. I'm never exactly sure what to expect in this asynchronous format, but you guys did a fantastic job. Keep up the good work. Midterm two is coming up right around the corner, so please make sure that you're keeping up with the lectures as we progress through the quarter. Given how well you did on midterm one, you can probably expect that midterm two will be a little bit more difficult and the focus is going to be different. This part of the class is going to be moving on towards diversity. And we're gonna start out today by talking about the bryophytes. The bryophytes are a really interesting group of plants that includes the liverworts, moss, and hornworts. They have a lot of features that sort of make them something like the amphibians of the plant world. They are heavily reliant on water, yet at the same time, many of them show this remarkable characteristic of poikilohydry, which means that they can adjust their body uh, chemistry and especially their water content to match that of the uh, environment. So please stay tuned as we progress. And remember, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to meet with you in the Zoom office hours. Let's get started. Our previous lecture was actually focused on a group exercise where we learned how to grow plants from cuttings by talking with Ernesto Sandoval at the Botanical Conservatory. In this lecture, we're gonna move on and start talking about liverworts, moss, and hornworts. Later on this week, we'll talk about ferns and their allies. In order to better understand liverworts, moss, and hornworts, it first helps to put plant evolution in context. And one of the key events in the evolution of plants was the transition from an aquatic environment to land. Most of the plants that you're familiar with are land-based, and so we want to ask the question, how did they get there? Recall from lecture one that this is a phylogeny, and a phylogeny shows relationships among groups of organisms. This phylogeny shows relationships among all eukaryotes. You might recognize eukaryotes as those organisms whose cells have a nucleus and a mitochondrion. And so if you look at this phylogeny closely, you might notice things like, well, there's animals. And so we know that human cells have a nucleus and a mitochondria, so that makes good sense. You might notice things like fungi. Some of these other groups of organisms you may not know very well, amoebozoans, excavates, rhizaria, stromenopiles, and alveolates are all referred to as microbial eukaryotes. But then here are the plants. And so plantae is a lineage that includes both aquatic and terrestrial representatives. And one of the cool things about this figure is that down below we have a time scale. So this tree is actually cal calibrated to specific dates. And one of the things that you'll notice is that plants are a very old lineage among eukaryotes. They go back almost 1.5 billion years. Now it's important to recognize that most of this time here, especially in early plant evolution, plants were entirely aquatic. It's only recently that they transitioned to life on land. Recall from our earlier lectures that the bulk of plant diversity, most of the plants that you know, are in the land plants. So here is a broader phylogeny that shows relationships among all plantae. And you'll notice there's lots of characters on here. I'm not really asking you to know any of these right now, but what I would ask you to do is realize that here are the land plants, which are oftentimes referred to as embryophytes for, reason, for reasons that we'll talk about in a little bit. And then all of these other lineages here, the stoneworts, the coleochetes, the green algae, etc., these are all aquatic. And so, bulk of the diversity that we want to learn about in this class is really focused in the land plants. And so we're gonna start by talking about liverworts, moss, and hornworts.
When people talk about plant evolution, one of the plants that comes up is called cara or the stone warts. And this is really because for the past 10 or 20 years, it was thought that cara was the closest living relative to the land plants. Now some recent analyses have shown that actually not to be true, but either way, they kind of give us some insight into maybe what an early uh, ancestor of land plants was like. And so stoneworts are freshwater algae, and they kind of live at this edge of land and water. So they're definitely submerged, but they're not usually not very deep. They have some specialized reproductive cells where they're keeping the reproductive cells kind of enclosed and encased, which is important because we'll talk about how that translates in land plants. And they tend to grow in these very filamentous ways. You know, another thing to think about with algae like cara is that they don't have things like stomata, obviously. They don't have things like lignin because their bodies are supported by the water around them. So they don't really have to deal with things like desiccation or drying out because they're in water. They don't have to really deal with things like support because they're supported by the buoyancy that they naturally have because they're surrounded by water, etc. So in general, algae don't have the same challenges as do land plants. And so when you think about land plants, you want to think about their characteristics and those defining characteristics of land plants, which are shown highlighted in this red box here, really are solutions to the problems that they had to face transitioning to life on land. So on this slide, I say the features that distinguish land plants are adaptations to life on land. And that's what I mean. There are solutions to this problem of things like support, things like reproduction, things like uh, photosynthesis and respiration, etc. And we'll talk more about those in just one moment. What I'd like you to do here is just take a moment and brainstorm what kinds of problems are you going to have to solve? So I've mentioned a couple, but think a little bit more carefully. How are you going to go from water to land? What kinds of solutions are you going to have to come up with? Remember that land plants, when they first transitioned to land, faced a whole new set of problems. And so think, what problems must land plants overcome in order to successfully transition to life on land? Hopefully the previous exercise helped you think a little bit more critically about the features you're going to have to change in order to transition from life in water to life on land. Four features really stand out as adaptations in plants to life on land. They are a multicellular sporophyte, a waxy cuticle, protected embryos, and sporopollenin. Now we've talked about several of these features in previous lectures, but let's take a few moments to elaborate on some of their details. Recall that a multicellular sporophyte is a fundamental feature of the land plant life cycle. That life cycle is called an alternation of generations because the plant shifts between a multicellular diploid stage and a multicellular haploid stage. Now, one thing that is difficult to wrap your head around when you start thinking about different plant groups is that the size and dominance of each of these stages changes depending on the group we're talking about. We're going to start by talking about bryophytes, which all are dominant in the gametophyte stage or the multicellular haploid stage, not the multicellular diploid stage. Either way, all land plants have a multicellular diploid stage whose job it is to produce spores called the sporophyte. Recall that a waxy cuticle is something produced by the epidermal layer of plants in order to prevent desiccation. If you think about something like algae, they live in water, so that's not really a problem in terms of desiccation. They're never going to dry out. But land plants have to go through some sort of process in order to prevent themselves from drying out. 
one thing that they do is secrete waxes to prevent drying out. Another thing that of course can happen, as we've learned about, is the opening and closing of stomata to regulate photosynthesis. Either way, all land plants tend to secrete waxes that help prevent desiccation. Something we haven't talked about yet is the fact that all land plants have protected embryos. Recall that I called land plants embryophytes. Phyte means plant. So these are the plants that protect the, their embryos, they're the embryo plants. And so if we look closely, what that means is that gametes like the egg are protected in a special jacket of sterile cells. And then once fertilized, you've made a unicellular diploid zygote that undergoes mitosis into a multicellular diploid stage, which we call the sporophyte. Because the plant holds on to the zygote and allows it to develop in place into an embryo, it's called a embryophyte. It protects its embryos. Last is the feature of sporopollenin, which we talked about previously as that special proteinaceous coating around spores that protects them from desiccation. So when you transition to life on land, you have to have some way of dispersal. And so sporopollenin is a coating that protects spores to allow them to travel further. Remember in algae, you have spores, but they're swimming spores called zoospores. Once you get to land, you have airborne spores that are coated by sporopollenin. Let's move on to talk specifically about the bryophytes. If we zoom in and have a closer look at land plant phylogeny, you can see the liverworts, mosses, and hornworts towards the base part of the tree. Now it's important to keep in mind that that doesn't mean that they're somehow primitive plants. They're all living at the same time as all the other plants that are around today, but they diverged earlier in the evolution of land plants. Now they all look very different from one another, um, and even though they're sort of small, obscure plants, when you look at the details, they're easy, easily separated from each other, bo both in terms of their morphology and, or outward appearance and their biology. So bryophytes, oftentimes referred to as the non-vascular plants because they lack xylem, includes liverworts, mosses, and hornworts. One thing that stands out about bryophytes is that they all tend to prefer cool, moist microhabitats. So if you look at this picture of a forest here, you can see that it looks really wet. It tends to be pretty shady. If you look closely here, you can see the moss coating this um, fallen log, and they tend to be really small plants. So they're oftentimes overlooked by botanists because they're small, they're somewhat obscure, they tend to prefer these really specialized micro environments. On the right here, you can see a hornwort. And again, this is the whole plant. So this is a really small plant, maybe as big as a half an inch to an inch in diameter, and that's it. Because bryophytes oftentimes prefer these cool, moist microenvironments, they're oftentimes thought of as the amphibians of the plant lineage. So they're just kind of in between transitioning to a life on land where they can live in a hot, dry, more exposed area, and sort of more close to water where they re really rely on water not only because they lack the vascular tissues, but also because of their reproduction. A fundamental feature of bryophyte biology is that they lack vascular tissues, they lack both xylem and phloem that are found in vascular plants. They also don't have roots. So here's a piece of a liverwort 
that I pulled up and you can see some stringy things that seem to be dangling off of the plant that look like roots and maybe even function a little bit like roots, but they're not true roots. In fact, they're just called rhizoids. And if you zoom in on a microscope, you can see that they tend to be just a single cell thick. They do help anchor the plant and they also help increase surface area for water absor absorption. But again, this is not using xylem tissue. Now, even though I do say that bryophytes lack any vascular tissue, what I mean specifically is they don't have xylem and phloem. And in fact, many species, most species of bryophytes, don't have anything even close to xylem and phloem. However, there are some groups um, of bryophytes, most notably polytrichum, um, which has something that's very similar. And so in some bryophytes, what you get are some specialized tissues for water and sugar transport. And these are called hydroids, which conduct water, and leptoids, which conduct sugars. And these things represent an independent evolution of water and sugar conducting tissues. Now, one thing that's really interesting is that if you look at hydroids and leptoids under a microscope, they're actually very similar to xylem and phloem. One of the things you'll notice is that they have pits. Here, um, you can see on this leptoid, you can see these pits. You can see that they're sort of stacked with um, some overlap, and this is not unlike what you would see in xylem and phloem tissue. And so, um, while most, well, most bryophytes don't have these hydroids and leptoids, there are some groups that do. If we look at a cross-section of uh, uh, polytrichum, what you'll see is in the very, very middle, you see this big group of cells that has kind of a larger diameter. These, in fact, are the hydroids where water is conducted. And then a ring of tissue cells that are a lot smaller in diameter, and these are the leptoids where sugar is conducted. And of course, beyond that, you find the parenchyma, which is pretty normal um, ground tissue for plants. Another interesting feature of the biology of bryophytes is that their stomata vary. So if you recall from earlier lectures, stomata are those pores, usually on the undersurfaces of leaves, another feature that bryophytes don't have, um, that are open or closed depending on how the plant is regulating photosynthesis. When the stomata are open, CO2 is coming in, water vapor is being released, and photosynthesis is active. When those stomata are closed, photosynthesis ceases to occur. Now, if you look closely at the image here of our moss, you can clearly see the two guard cells. And it's important to also keep in mind that the guard cells are not controlled by something like a muscle. They're actually controlled by water pressure. So the turgor pressure inside the cells is what keeps them open or closed. If you look at a hornwort stomata, you can also see those guard cells there surrounding the stomata pore in the middle. However, in liverworts, you actually don't have those guard cells. So liverworts, in contrast to moss and hornworts, are less able to regulate their photosynthesis. So they lack guard cells and thus have to rely on other ways to make sure that they're not drying out. Now at this point, you might be thinking, okay, so bryophytes are these small obscure plants that have to live in these really wet environments. That means that as soon as they dry out, they probably die. And it's actually the reverse. So believe it or not, bryophytes are actually more resistant to drying out than almost any other plant. So for example, if you went on vacation and left your house plant without water for a couple of weeks, you're likely to come home to a dead plant. When you came back, if you say had a house plant that was a moss, 
that moss might have completely dried out to almost 0% water. And then as soon as you add more water, it can actually come back. So this feature of their biology is called poikilohydry. And what that means is that the water content of their cells matches the water content in the outside air. So despite the fact that bryophytes need those cool, wet environments, it doesn't mean that they're intolerant of desiccation. In fact, in most of the habitats that they live, there are cycles of wetter and drier periods, and they're very well adapted to dealing with those lower water conditions in addition to the higher water conditions, which they prefer. As I mentioned a moment ago, bryophytes also lack true leaves. So it may look like on close inspection that some bryophytes have something that's similar to leaves, but again, it's, they're not quite true leaves. So if you look closely, one of the things you'll notice is that one of these leaves is actually comprised of a layer of cells that's just one cell thick. And in many species, there's no midrib. So in this case, there is this midrib, this piece of stem, off of which these tiny little structures, which are not true leaves, despite the labeling in the figure, are growing off. But again, they're just one cell thick, and you'll notice they are free from any kind of venation that you would see in a typical leaf. Let's take a moment to think about the life cycle of bryophytes as it actually goes a long way towards explaining their biology. If you recall from earlier in the lecture, I told you that one of the key innovations of land plants is that multicellular diploid stage, which we call the sporophyte. Now recall that land plants have that alternation of generations life cycle, where they're switching in between a multicellular diploid stage and a multicellular haploid stage. Now the relative size and importance of the sporophyte and gametophyte stages varies depending on the group that we're talking about. So in bryophytes, for example, their body plan includes a dominant gametophyte generation and a smaller nutritionally dependent sporophyte generation. So if we look at this figure on the left, you see a chunk of moss here, and all of the green stuff that you're seeing happens to be the gametophyte generation. If you think back to the life cycle, this is the stage that ends up producing the gametes. If we were to zoom in, oftentimes you'll see specialized structures that extend out from the top of the gametophyte, and usually, those structures are either light green or even brown. This is the sporophyte generation. So these capsules are where spores will be produced and eventually released. So we have a dominant gametophyte and we have a sporophyte that's attached to the gametophyte. So that's what we mean when we say the sporophyte is nutritionally dependent on the gametophyte generation. It can never live independent of the gametophyte and relies on the gametophyte's capacity for photosynthesis to sustain itself. Recall from our previous lectures that the sporophyte, which is diploid, produces spores. Those spores are resistant to desiccation because of sporopollenin. So spores are one of those key innovations and the evolution of land plants. Spores are used for dispersal. If we watch this video again, you'll see that the green stuff here, again, is the gametophyte. What's growing out the top is the sporophyte generation. And eventually, when they get tall enough, they pop, and all these little red dots here happen to be spores that can be carried by wind or flung about in order to grow eventually into new gametophytes. For this reason, the alternation of generations life cycle in land plants is oftentimes referred to as the sporic alternation of generations life cycle.
Let's take a moment to zoom in on the specialized structures on gametophytes. First thing to note is that gametophytes are the part of the plant that produces the gametes, but it's not like any cell on the gametophyte can just become a gamete. Instead, there are specialized structures that produce both eggs and or sperm. And so these structures are called gametangia. The first structure we'll talk about are archegonia. Archegonia are the structures that produce eggs. So if we've zoomed in here on this liverwort cross section, you can see something that looks kind of like a vase. This is a sterile jacket of cells that is um, surrounding the egg on the inside. This is the archegonium. You can see another one here, and you can see another one here. Antheridia are those structures that produce sperm. So again, on a cross-section of a liverwort, you can see the antheridia here, and if you look on the inside, you can see a bunch of developing sperm. So in summary, gametangia are those structures on the gametophyte where gametes are produced. The structure that produces the egg is the archegonium. The structure that produces sperm is the antheridium. Let's consider some aspects of the diversity of bryophytes. The first group we'll talk about are the liverworts. Liverworts have two different body plans. They have one that's called thallos, and they have another one that is called leafy. Now the thallos liverworts are pretty typical. They look like uh, they have a leaf-like body plan, even though this is not a leaf, that's been split in two. And so this is the thallus, and they tend to be kind of hard and stiff. And uh, as I showed you earlier, if you pull one out slowly, you can see the rhizoids on the undersurfaces. Now this contrasts pretty starkly with a leafy liverwort, which looks like the picture I showed you earlier, where you have a bunch of very small leaf-like structures with or without a midrib. So the thallos liverworts tend to have one larger leaf-like body plan called a thallos. And then the leafy liverworts are comprised of several really small leaf-like structures with or without a midrib. These two body plants are starkly different in how their sporophyte looks. Now we're starting with liverworts because liverworts have the most reduced sporophyte among the bryophytes. And so if we look on the left, you can see the thallos liverwort body plan, and then you have these structures that are growing up that kind of look like little palm trees. And so what I want you to notice is that this structure is all still gametophyte. One way you can tell is that it's green. So all this stuff, even though it looks like it might be the sporophyte, is still just the gametophyte. In fact, when you zoom in, you see some small little yellow structures branching off. Almost like if that were a tree, these would be the little fruitlets. This is actually the sporophyte. So this tiny structure here hanging off the gametophyte is the sporophyte where the spores are eventually going to be released. Leafy liverworts, in contrast, have a sporophyte that's watery and very short-lived. If you look closely, you can see this extension here. This whole extension happens to be the sporophyte. And then at the very top, you have that structure where spores are eventually released called the sporangium. So leafy liverworts tend to have a sporophyte that's watery and relatively short-lived, whereas in thallos liverworts, the sporophyte is really small and tucked under the larger extensions of the gametophyte. The last thing to note about the thallos liverworts is that the extensions of the gametophytes have two different appearances. One is like this, where it sort of looks like a little extension of a palm tree, and the other one is here, 
which is actually a lot more flat and doesn't have these finger-like extensions. The flat ones are where you find the antheridia. So sperm have to leave this structure and then somehow swim through water across the thallus body, swim up the stalk, and eventually make it to the archegonium where they will fertilize the egg and then that egg eventually develops into the multicellular diploid sporophyte. So when you look closely, it's actually quite amazing that, sp that sperm have to travel that entire distance. Again, from here, across the body, all the way up the stalk to the archegonium where they will fertilize the egg that will eventually develop into the sporophyte. When you compare liverworts to hornworts, there are some similarities, but hornworts really stand out in terms of the structure of their sporophyte and the appearance of their gametophyte tissue. Hornworts tend to look sort of glistening, almost like a gummy bear appearance. Oftentimes they even have a blue-green color, which is the result of symbiotic cyanobacteria. The standout feature among them, however, is the long horn-like extension shown here, and that is the sporophyte. The sporophyte of hornworts has indeterminate growth, so it will continue to grow throughout the entire life of the plant. If you look closely at a hornwort, it also has rhizoids, not unlike the liverwort, and there is an antheridium and archegonium, and so the sperm maybe have a little easier time here because they just have to swim through water on the surface of the hornwort body. Now, one question that you might ask about the indeterminate growth on the sporophyte is how that's accomplished. And believe it or not, there are basal, not apical, meristems here that will continue to divide cells to make the hornwort horn a lot longer. And then the spores are released actually from the base here in a sort of cup-like extension, which you can see on the right. Coming back briefly to the structure of hornworts, many of them have a blue-green appearance. This blue-green gummy bear-like appearance is the result of a symbiosis that they have formed with cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria can be seen here and they look like a string of pearls, but if you look closely, you'll notice that some of the cells look different than others. And that's because the smoother cells are uh, able to fix atmospheric nitrogen and provide that as a nutrient to the plant. So these cyanobacteria live inside the cells of the hornwort and provide them with a source of nitrogen. Of the bryophyte lineages, mosses really stand out as being distinctive. They're the most commonly seen and probably something you're a little bit more familiar with. In contrast to liverworts and hornworts, mosses tend to have a little bit taller, more three-dimensional growth. And one key feature of mosses that most people notice are these elongate extensions, which are the sporophyte. So again, this green stuff here, this is all the gametophyte tissue, and then the sporophyte grows out of the gametophyte tissue and culminates in a special cap-like structure, which we call a sporangium. On the far right, you can see that I've circled the sporangium, and if you zoom in even closer, you can see that the tip of the sporangium is surrounded almost by like a series of little teeth. And what happens is, as the humidity changes, these teeth open and close and fling out spores at some distance to help with dispersal. So again, slightly different than the sporophytes of hornworts in that they don't have an indeterminate growth and they have that very recognizable sporangium. And then again, very different than the sporophyte of liverworts, which is very small and reduced and the thallus liverworts, and maybe a little similar to the watery, leafy liverworts, but again, the sporophyte of mosses is a lot longer lived.
So let's take a moment to think a little bit more carefully about the life cycle of bryophytes. And the example I'm going to use is the life cycle of a moss, which is a pretty classic example for reproduction in bryophytes. So first, let's start with the bryophyte general body plan. And because we're using a moss, I'm going to draw the gametophyte body as green. And remember that that means that this part is actually multicellular and haploid. And then extending from that is the multicellular diploid part of the plant, which is the sporophyte. And you can see that I've drawn the little cap here, which is called the sporangium. Angium means house or container, so the sporangium is the house or container that encloses the spores. And so the important thing to think about here, again, is our alternation of generations life cycle. So somehow we have to go from our sporophyte, which is multicellular and diploid, through spores, which are haploid, to a multicellular haploid gametophyte, then gametes, sperm and egg, which fuse to make our zygote, that then grows into our new sporophyte. That's our alternation of generations life cycle. And so what has to happen is that we're going to start out with a male moss and a female moss. And when I say male moss and female moss, there's it's true that some mosses have definite sexes, but some of them have both archegonia and antheridia. I'm just going to start try to keep it a little bit simple here. And so we'll say this is our female and this is our male. And if you remember, sperm are produced in the antheridia. And so what happens is sperm actually have to release from here, and they usually have two flagelli. Here's our sperm. And then the female has that special structure which makes eggs called the archegonium. If I draw another female moss here, the sperm actually swims to the archegonium, finds the egg, fertilizes the egg, and then you end up with our zygote. Once we have a zygote, that zygote then undergoes mitosis. As it divides, it eventually grows into that multicellular diploid stage called the sporophyte. So again, the key detail here is that sperm actually has to swim through water in order to reach the archegonium, find the egg, and successfully complete the life cycle. So let's wrap up by thinking about the implications of bryophytes to human society. So why should you care? 
These are really small, obscure little plants that very few people actually notice. Well, there's a couple of really good reasons, one of which is really interesting, and that is that bryophytes, because of their poikilohydry, tend to sequester or reflect the pollutants that are in the outside air. So because of this, they're actually really good indicators of air and water quality. And it so happens that in some places, especially in Europe, you have these moss walls, which are really nice and decorative, but also serve a functional purpose in terms of monitoring air and water quality in the city. So biologists from the city will periodically come, take a sample of the moss growing on this moss wall, have it analyzed to get an idea what the concentration of pollutants are in this area. Also because of their poikilohydry, they tend to store a lot of micronutrients. And so in forest ecology, bryophytes are important warehouses of micronutrients, which they've collected from the atmosphere. And then of course, when they die, get re-released back into the environment to keep that forest healthy. Bryophytes also have a really interesting history in terms of human society, particularly with peat bogs. So sphagnum mosses have really amazing preservative properties um, once they get compressed and stacked over many, many hundreds or thousands of years. And these are oftentimes referred to as bogs, where oxygen is very low, acidity tends to be pretty high, and this happens to be a site uh, for sort of sacrifices and burials. Among the most famous are these bogs in Denmark, where you can see examples of things like the Tolan Man, which unfortunately probably had a really not so uh, pleasant end to his life. But if you look closely, the features of this person have been intricately preserved due to the unique conditions in the peat bogs. Now these peat bogs are actually really extensive and they're also important carbon sinks. So they have a lot of stored carbon and have clearly been important in terms of history and human cultures. A last maybe more fun fact is that some of these peat mosses are actually used as part of the flavoring in some scotch whiskies. If you like scotch from something like Isla, for example, they use peat moss from their surrounding environment to flavor the drink. Because of its absorptive properties, sphagnum moss also has a history of being used as a wound dressing. And so in World War I, for example, sphagnum moss, as shown here, has been used as a bandage. And you had to read about a really uh, amazing story of how this has happened in the Smithsonian article that I've um, linked here. Now, given that we're talking about mosses in this lecture, I can't help but mention this really cool place. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, there is a park that's not too far from Seattle. If you ever were into the books, uh, the Twilight books, then it's actually outside the town of Forks. So if you can look over here on the left-hand side, you can see the town of Forks. And a sort of dirt road takes you to the Ho Rainforest. And the Ho Rainforest is an amazing place because it gets a huge amount of rain each year, over 140 inches, and has a great wealth of many awesome bryophytes. And so I'm going to show you some photos here and a couple of videos. My only warning is that I was still really learning how to use my camera, so don't judge me too harshly for things that didn't quite come out. But still, if you ever have the chance, you should go have a look. Thank you.
now that we've learned a little bit about bryophytes, the next step is to start to consider how we're going to get from a small, relatively obscure plant to something larger that you're more familiar with. In this forest, for example, we have moss, but we also have large dug fir trees, which is a conifer. What changes are going to have to be made to the biology of the organism in order to go from a small plant to a large plant that we're more familiar with? In this lecture, we learned about the biology of bryophytes. Some important takeaways are the history of plants evolving from an aquatic existence to life on land and the adaptations they had to make in order to make that transition. We also explored bryophyte diversity and their relevance to human society. Make sure to have a look at the life cycle of a moss as it's very representative of bryophyte reproduction. Thanks and I'll see you next time.